Good evening, all. I'm Adam Weinberg, the Alice Pratt Brown Director of the Whitney Museum. Welcome to a conversation marking the 20th anniversary of the landmark exhibition in the Whitney's history, Black Male Representations of Masculinity in Contemporary American Art. I want to thank the New School for hosting us tonight, in particular, Dean Stephanie Brower, Professor So Yun Yoon, and the Arts Department of Eugene Lang College. As the Whitney prepares to open its new building at Gansport and Washington Street on May 1st, we have used the opportunity to look back at our history. Donna DeSalvo, the Whitney's Chief Curator and Deputy Director of Programs, has guided the museum through a multi-year research project on the Whitney's collections and exhibitions. Tonight, we would like to highlight and reflect on one of the defining exhibitions in our history with the curator, Thelma Golden who helped shape the Whitney's program during the 90s and whose work continues to shape the current landscape of contemporary art in very important ways. <laughs> when Black Mail opened in 1994, it was a flashpoint. It entered into and exploded a cultural conversation in a way that contemporary art exhibitions rarely do these days. Seeking to examine the black male as body and political icon, Thelma included works by 29 artists, male and female, black and white, whose works challenged, quote, and deconstructed stereotypical representations. Beyond the critical responses to the show, the significance of this exhibition also has to do with how it engaged the museum's own history with questions of identity and representation. Although the Whitney collected modestly the work of African-American artists such as Nancy Elizabeth Prophet and Richmond Barte beginning in the 1930s, it was not until 1969 that the museum began a programmatic effort to exhibit the work of black artists. In 1971, an exhibition called Contemporary Black Artists in America, which was quite controversial at the time, was, for many reasons, was the museum's first concerted effort to present a group show of the work of African-American artists. A little over 20 years before Black Male, this exhibition was an attempt at a corrective to the museum's lack of attention to black artists and to engage broader cultural conversations about representation at the end of the 1960s. More than two decades later, Black Male reframed the problem of representation, focusing less on the identities of artists and considering instead the historical and cultural weight of visual representations at large. Its legacy at the Whitney has not been, not only been solo shows by African American artists such as Glenn Ligon and Lorna Simpson, who were both included in Black Male, but also recent thematic group shows like Blues for Smoke. Twenty years ago, with exhibitions like Black Male, the Whitney began to ask questions about itself and its mission. What does it mean to represent the art of the United States and who are its audiences? In a review of Black Male, published in Art Forum, the critic Homi Baba wrote that the Whitney had begun to, quote, turn a national museum from a celebratory space into an interrogative institution. This questioning remains central, and I hope will always remain central to the Whitney's program. In some ways, 20 years is an arbitrary number. Um, it is really isn't so long ago, although I was talking to a number of my staff, and most of them were between ages five and 10 when the show opened, so I guess it's longer than I realized. <laughs> I'm sorry, Steph. <laughs> There's also no end or beginning to the questions raised by black male. As Henry Louis Gates wrote in his preface to the black male catalog, which actually is something that could have been written yesterday, the black male has been represented in Western culture as the central enigma of, of a humanity wrapped in the darkest and deepest subliminal fantasies of Europe and America's collective cultural id. And tragically, every African-American male who walks down any street in America carried with him the hidden heritage of this negative cultural and psychological legacy. If, as some might say, identity politics fell out of fashion in the art world, the social and political realities that Thelma and the artists in black male were addressing never went away. And just the past few weeks have snapped back into the foreground of our collective consciousness with renewed urgency and made this discussion tonight more timely than ever, sadly. On that note, I will introduce our three speakers tonight. Alma Golden is the director and chief curator of the Studio Museum in Harlem, an art museum founded in 1968 
whose mission is to serve as the nexus for artists of African American descent locally, nationally, and internationally. Thelma joined the Whitney in 1988, just around actually the time I first did too. And during her tenure, she was a member of the curatorial team for the 1993 Biennial and served as the director of the Whitney Museum at Philip Norris. At the Studio Museum, she has organized many notable exhibitions, including Chris Ophelia, Afro Muses, 1995 to 2005, Black Romantic, Freestyle, Frequency, Glenn Ligon, Stranger, and Gordon Parks, A Harlem Family, 1967, and many others. Under her leadership, the Studio Museum has gained increasing renown as a global leader in the exhibition of contemporary art, a center for innovative education, and a site for diverse audiences to exchange ideas about art and society. In 2010, Thelma was appointed by President Barack Obama as a member of the Committee for the Preservation of the White House. She also serves as the Manhattan Vice Chair of the Cultural Institutions Group, a very important function that she's serving for so many of us here in New York. And of course, she is an active lecturer, panelist, speaking about contemporary art and culture at national and international institutions. Very grateful to have our friend Hilton Alls here tonight, who was the editor of the exhibition catalog for Black Mail <laughs> way back when. <laughs> Currently, he is a staff writer at The New Yorker, where he has been a theater critic since 2002. He has written for numerous publications, including The Village Voice, Vibe, and The Nation. His first book, The Women, A Meditation on Gender, Race, and Personal Identity, was published in 1996. His most recent book, White Girls, discusses various narratives around race and gender. Other recent publications include an essay on the art of Robert Gober for his current retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art, The Heart is Not a Metaphor. In 1997, the New York Association of Black Journalists awarded Alls first prize in both Magazine Critique Review and Magazine in Arts and Entertainment. He's received a Guggenheim Fellowship for Creative Writing and the George Jean Nathan Award for Dramatic Criticism, and Hilton has taught at Yale, Wesleyan Smith, and other places as well. <laughs> Many other. <laughs> Yui Copeland, thank you for being here, Yui, is an associate professor of art history at Northwestern University now for a decade. His writing focuses on modern and contemporary art with emphasis on the articulation of blackness in Western visual field and the intersections of race, class, gender, and sexuality within global aesthetic practice. His book, Bound to Appear, Art, Slavery, and the Site of Blackness in Multicultural America, published in 2013, focuses on the work of Renee Green, Glenn Ligon, Lorna Simpson, and Fred Wilson to consider how slavery shaped American art in the last decades of the 20th century. At present, Copeland is at work on a new book, In the Arms of the Negress, A Brief History of Modern Artistic Practice, that explores the constitutive role played by fictions of black womanhood in Western art from the 19th century to the present. He's a regular contributor to Art Forum, and his writing has been published in numerous international exhibition catalogs. And we're proud that he was not only an intern for Thelma Golden way back when, but he was also a part of the Whitney's Independent Study Program. I want to thank the three of you so much for being here tonight. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, there we go. Um, well, thank you, uh, Adam, for that lovely introduction, and to Catherine Potts and Megan Hoyer in particular, at the Whitney's Education Department for organizing this event. It's a pleasure to be back in New York at the New School with the Whitney, and really an honor to share the stage with Thelma and Hilton, thinkers who have meant so much to me and to all of us, particularly on this occasion and in this moment. As we're all well aware, the nationwide protests of the unpunished murders of two unarmed black men, Michael Brown, and Eric Garner have again brought into vivid focus how the black male is a perennial site of fear and projection, policing and pathology, contestation and coalition. To look back at the exhibition Black Male, then, is in part to reconsider how those logics took shape at a particular moment in our history, and how one institution and one visionary curator understood the ways the artists were trying to engage, refute, or bypass the visual effects of those conditions in making innovative aesthetic forms. So I thought we would start by trying to home in on that moment of the early 90s. And Thelma, I wonder if you could speak about the circumstances and histories, personal 
professional, artistic, institutional that led you to the exhibition, and then how Hilton became involved in it. And then if you could each in turn say something about how the unfolding of the show, its various kinds of receptions in New York and Los Angeles might have shifted your sense of what the show was doing. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, it would be completely disingenuous of me not to admit how much trepidation I had about this conversation tonight. Um, and part of it has to do with the fact that you were going to ask me that question and many more, which in many ways I have yet to fully myself understand and be able to answer. So before I answer, I just have to say um, a few thank yous because mm -hmm. 20 years ago feels like yesterday and it also feels like 100 years ago. Mm. But the truth is there's so much conversation about the singularity of my vision around blackmail, but really it was the effort of many people. And I have to start by thanking David Ross, who was director of the Whitney at that time. Okay. Because as any curator knows, the ability to do your work is made possible by a uh, kind of leadership that is open to a broad range of conversations. And David made that possible for me as a young curator and a curator who had a very distinct idea of what I imagine I wanted to do. I also have to thank my colleagues at the Whitney at that time, Adam Weinberg, who of course is the amazing visionary director of the Whitney today, was a curatorial colleague. But in many ways, there would not have been a black male if there had not been a 1993 biennial. So I have to thank Elizabeth Sussman, who very appropriately is sitting right here, looking at me as she did all those years, as she created and nurtured in me um, what it meant to be making the kind of work I want to make. But I also want to thank all my uh, colleagues of that period, Lisa Phillips, John Hanhart, Connie Wolf. Prior to my time as a curator, as a curatorial assistant with Richard Armstrong, Richard Marshall, and the whole range of the Whitney, the entire Whitney staff that really made that moment possible. Not just the moment of blackmail, but those years, um, the 90s in many mm -hmm. ways, mm -hmm. which still for me sit as being um, super important. I have to thank all of the artists in the exhibition. I mean, that goes without saying. The show wouldn't have been what it was without them. But I have to, as I always do, if I'm talking about anything that I've done that has to do with the life of my mind, and I have to thank Glenn Ligon. Um, Glenn, who just got off of a plane that was delayed from LA, thank you. Um, then and now, the 20 years between as well. And also, as you said, the real, you know, Hilton, it's so funny, I never realized that what we referred to you as was the editor of the catalog, because your role was so all-encompassing. And really, Hilton's role in blackmail was that Hilton was there with me literally, from the very beginning of the thoughts and the ideas to the real shaping of them as they became an exhibition, a physical exhibition, and a catalog, and then as they lived in the world ever since. So I have to thank Hilton um, for that. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> in, that, in that moment. And then I also want to thank um, all the people in my current life at the Studio Museum in Harlem. I would not be there had it not been for the moment of blackmail to give me the vision of what it would mean to have the privilege of being the director of an institution that was founded to present the work of artists of African descent and to do it in ways that were radical and innovative and interesting. So I want to thank the Studio Museum staff and board then and now. You know, that's really the tip of that iceberg of what that was, because really, how did blackmail come to be? Well, in acknowledging what was the great privilege, but also the great challenge of understanding who I would be as a curator at the Whitney Museum in 1993 or 1994, as I began to think about this exhibition, it became clear to me um, that if I didn't imagine an exhibition that would define not only my own sense of what could be important about art and artists, but also define a way that I could sort of chart a path to open yeah. up some broader conversations, um, then I knew that that's really what my work had to be. And so Blackmail really started as a series of just very episodic conversations um, with art artists about their work with the backdrop of all that was happening in that period 
it happened as a result of my own relationship to thinking about how I could understand cultural specificity and exhibition making with the broad history of this in museums. It happened as a result, as I said, of working um, on the 1993 biennial and seeing a way that there was a path that was being created for me to think about how identity politics could make an exhibition. I don't, you know, I know that there'll be a time when I'll be able to have a, a much more direct sense of how this exhibition really happened, but now it still continues to feel like the, the collision of a million different ways in which artworks, artists, and ideas came together in that moment that then, you know, on November 8th kind of opened up and were an exhibition. How Hilton got involved is I think that then like now, my only way to understand a lot of what I'm doing is that I hear the echo of my voice in Hilton's projection back to me, right? So I say something and Hilton, the great writer editor, usually says it back better than I said it myself. <laughs> and then in those conversations- I remember that, it was the- um, oops, You need a mic. Um, it was Thelma, I, I'm actually starting, you might see me sort of actually start crying during this conversation because what's happening is that I'm actually remembering the chronology of something and Elizabeth's show had opened and I wrote a, not, I wrote, I wrote a critical piece about it in Art Forum and the fact that Thelma hired me anyway <laughs> after that, I had not actually worked that out in my mind until we were just backstage and I was looking at the year mm -hmm. and I realized that part of what makes particularly New York a very interesting place. Um, I always say everyone in New York is Jewish because we argue and we are there for each other simultaneously. And Thelma saw in what I was writing, not just in art form, but in the voice prior to that, something that applied mm -hmm. and could be constructive. It wasn't a destructive conversation. Mm -hmm. And the first time we met about it really was one of the first times we ever met. And she had me she knew that I actually spent many evenings at the Odeon misbehaving. <laughs> and she had me meet her at the Odeon. And the first thing I, she said, this idea about black maleness, and I said, oh, you should just paint the galleries red, black, and green. Mm. And it was the first thing that yeah, we said. Exactly. And yeah. she said, and she laughed, and she said, I don't know if they'll do that, but let's go. Yeah. And that's that how was it started. It, it is, exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly. And I think that, in that, I already, I mean, Hilton had written really um, powerfully about many of the artists who mm -hmm. would form the base of the work in blackmail. Actually, a lot of my understanding of some of those artists came from reading Hilton's writing mm -hmm. about them in the Village Voice. Mm -hmm. So my sense in the late 80s as a student in Northampton, Massachusetts, waiting for the voice to come, which I guess was driven up from New York, so it took <laughs> days, but to read Hilton's writing was my sense of understanding about the terrain that mm. really did become what blackmail was. But really, in the very beginning, it felt like in those nights at the Odeon, you mm -hmm. and your socks and your Birkenstocks <laughs> and your <laughs> coat over your pajamas, yeah. like that, you know, we really... It was bigger than my living room. Yeah, so. it, and it, it, was the, it was your look at yeah. that moment. But what really happened in that moment was that I began to work out not just the ideas for blackmail, but I realized I worked out many of the ideas that have informed my work since, right? Yes. That we were talking through the possibility of what it could mean to make an exhibition like this, to present artists in this way, to look at the complicated mm. spaces and say, is there a way in a museum, in a museum context, mm. that this could happen? And that it was so, really it, it's so, it's because we have to tell, the children that the language didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Like the language, I mean, I was writing stuff, but the, there really was no core curriculum. There was no discussion. All I could do was describe what I was seeing and responding to. And what Thelma was doing that was very, what, that was completely profound and radical was she was doing it in an institution, which, in an art institution and in New York. I mean, these were three, three levels of experience that I had not encountered before. So that's the first thing I wanted to say about her radicalism. And the second thing was, um, 
I was a student at Columbia of a very great professor, and I hope you all study with him at NYU. His name is Kenneth Silver. Mm. And he, along with Elaine Pagels, told me not to become an art historian, only, only because, given my sensibility, I would not be able to deal with the academy very well, and that I was a writer. Um, and so writing about art was a way of educating myself, but what Thelma was really was my PhD that I never got. Mm. Um, in terms of the academy, how do you make the institution work with radicalism, and also how do you make the institution new when the institution mm. is asking for a new image of itself. So those, that's a three-tiered wedding cake um, that she gave New York, and so I just want to thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't do it um, because I did not know how it worked. Mm -hmm. mm. I could only respond. Mm -hmm. Thelma knew how the institution worked, and within the institution, how do you make various conversations happen um, with permission, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so I remember that I said, why don't you paint it red, black, and green, which is the colors of the black liberation flag when I was growing up. And that energy or that imaginative aspect is what Thelma did in terms of the people that she was curating. Um, again, these, were, these people were not really famous, as famous as they are now. Um, they were not marginalized, but they were not really known. Um, there were names, quote unquote, that carried the show in terms of the press, but th most of the artists that were interesting to her were not showing or making a lot of money at that time at all. So I wanted to ask Thelma this, Hugh, if you don't mm -hmm. mind. When you, started, when you started to make a list of people, um, did you see it as, let's say, I'll, um, I'll just pick someone out of the hat. Uh, Adrian Piper mm -hmm. um, was someone that was known. Mm -hmm. Were you looking at the ways in which that artistic genealogy could happen? Well, I, post Adrian, yeah, post, well, I was actually looking at how I could begin to contribute to an art history that was slightly different than the art history I was given or taught. Right. So in many ways, for me, Blackmail really was an exhibition that began and centered around Adrian Piper, David Hammonds, and Robert Colescott. Right. That was sort of the holy trinity right. for me. And, mm -hmm. and I wanted in some way to imagine that if I started there, that I was going to possibly create a new pathway mm -hmm. for thinking about black artists and their work through a conceptual lens. And so really the exhibition, that, that was a beginning, but it was a beginning that was made necessary by the fact that there were actual works of art being made by my peers, the mm -hmm. artists of our generation, mm -hmm. that really made this show seem completely necessary and possible. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was one, of, one of the things that I remember and remember now mm -hmm. is um, that so much of it was pointing towards the future. When you go mm -hmm. to a large exhibition or, or survey even, um, most of it, when they say fr from 1987 to 2014, they mean that, mm -hmm. and it stops there. One of the things that I remember so well about blackmail was that it was like looking at um, a vista Mm -hmm. and something that was opening as, mm -hmm. as opposed to something that was closing. So I like to go, I used to go see the show from time to time and I would always start at a different point mm -hmm. and I always ended up at the same point which was next. Like the mm -hmm. question in my mind or the mm -hmm. statement in my mind was mm -hmm. next. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I'd ever really felt that in a museum. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely amazing. Um, and I think, I mean for someone, like myself, who was, what, 18, when... Uh, Don't rub it in. <laughs> when, uh, when the show opened, <laughs> I mean, to have that catalog and, you know, not having had the opportunity to see the show, but to have that catalog, I mean, it was, to my mind, 
this was the future. It was constructing a discourse to which I would belong and really marked a kind of generational shift in terms of what would be possible for me and a whole range of scholars and thinkers who would emerge in the wake with this as a kind of you know Bible in terms of our thought. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's so fascinating about the exhibition and how it unfolded, that it resulted in this book, which is a kind of landmark anthology um, that people return to um, you know, endlessly. But it also is something that sparked so many conversations, so many forms, and had so many kind of complex manifestations, like this wonderful film program, right? Which was in five different parts. John Hanhart tapped this range of um, scholars and film thinkers about film, Philip Brian Harper, Herman Gray, uh, Ed Guerrero, Valerie Smith, um, Clyde Taylor, to produce all these programs. So I was just wondering, you know, if y'all could talk about doing this show and having such a kind of capacious, kind of multi-pronged approach to cultural practice and curatorial practice. I'm thinking about, um, go ahead. Um, <laughs> You know, it really, the show demanded that. You know, again, as I say, I go back to, you know, thinking colleagues. At that time, you know, the exhibition catalog format was slightly different than this. Mm -hmm. But it was very clear that to enter into this topic, we needed not just a multi-author volume, but, you know, many, many authors coming from very different points of view, that we needed the film program. You know, Maurice Berger did an amazing timeline that mm -hmm. existed physically in the exhibition. That was critically important. Connie Wolf organized a series of public programs that both related to the film program, the book, and the exhibition itself. All of that was sort of part of what it felt to me was an important way, not just to make sense of the exhibition, but also to engage the audience that I really was hoping mm. would come to this exhibition, mm. you know? Because that's really what this was about for me as well. Could I, how could I be occupying this role that I had? a curator at the Whitney Museum, given the opportunity to make an exhibition, and to do that for what I imagine could be a broad and wide audience. And it felt like the programming and the way in which the book was organized were meant to do that. No, that's wonderful. So I wonder if you could, I mean, talk a little bit more about that kind of fantasized audience. I mean, just broad, or were there specific constituencies that you were hoping to like newly bring to the Whitney and somehow change the culture around it and the institution? Well, I think, I mean, <laughs> it was hard um, because she, the, the re, I wasn't mentioning my biography gratuitously. Thelma had to translate me mm. to the institution, first of all. And if you know anything about me, that's like a nightmare because, <laughs> because I don't understand the rules generally. So Thelma's job was to take all of the people that she's mentioned and that you've mentioned, remember from the book and translate it in a language that the institution understood, but there was no language for it. So that's what was kind of profound. And that's what I mean by the radical aspect of it, was that mm -hmm. she was inventing the language to translate people like me. But here's the truth of it, you know? And this is why it's so you know, complicated to talk about this now, because it's so hard for me to really touch and feel how it felt then. Mm -hmm. But here was a true reality. Um, I was 27 when I made that exhibition. For my 30th birthday, Glenn Ligon designed a hypothetical cover of my potential memoirs to be written in the future. And he gave me several alternate titles. And one of them was a takeoff of that Gelsey Kirkland book, and it was, I'm curating as fast as I can. <laughs> <laughs> so some of what that was was, you know what? I didn't know this could have been my first and last yeah. curatorial project. And my attitude was, I was getting everything in mm -hmm. that I could. Everything, everyone, <laughs> right? Everyone was going to come see it. You know, I, I, I could not trust necessarily the potential um, of this moment. Now, what's amazing 20 years later is all that has happened since. But I have to make you understand that on, say, November 1st, 1994, I could not imagine what November 10th, right, the day when the yeah. show opened to the public, mm. was going to be like, because there was no context to understand it. So some of it was also a very um, 
strategic and practical approach to what I hoped would be the potential for mm. the kind of change I was hoping to affect. I, I wasn't. You, you did it. You yeah, mean, but I wasn't so clear at the time that it would, you know, have the path that it has had. I, I was just, I was just working. And the truth yeah. is, I've been working ever since. So that's also why. <laughs> It's true. It's also why I haven't had the time, you know, to always have this backward glance because there's still a whole lot of work to be done. Yes. I'm not, you know, it, that that did not feel like this is it and, and now let's sit back and analyze, you know, right. deeply. You know, many people know, um, you know, as, as Adam said, the exhibition also took on a life of its own, a mm -hmm. life far bigger than I would have ever imagined for the exhibition and for the way in which it played out, not just here in New York City, but also when it went to LA in yes. the um, winter of 1995. And that life really was happening while I was still continuing to form my life as a curator. So some of also what is so interesting to me about thinking about that moment and thinking about what I was thinking is that I was continuing to imagine how, how I would continue to work, how I would continue mm. to think through these ideas and work with artists and make exhibitions. Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, the, the show, you know, there was a huge reaction, a voluminous body of criticism that keeps on go growing and growing at this point this point, and responses in various forms. So in LA, of course, Cecil Ferguson curated a series of you know, counter exhibitions um, that were part of this larger kind of critical response and critical discourse. But I think so often in the kind of conversation that is had about the show, uh, there's a focus on the issues and some of the controversy around it without actually a kind of thinking through or engagement with the specific curatorial intelligence mm -hmm. that's on view in the show. Mm -hmm. And so you'll read reviews and it's like, why is there this picture of Robert Mablethorpe and black penises yet again without actually thinking about, well, yes, that's there. Mm -hmm. And yes, these are actually incredibly beautiful images that are not simply reproductions of stereotype, but are producing the black male body as an interesting shape. And they're very pointedly put in conversation with these Andres Serrano photographs that are across mm -hmm. from them, right? That you as a viewer have to navigate them. And I think, um, you know, there's an argument being made there about the relationships between those works. So I just wonder if you can maybe think about, um, you know, the kind of, kind of conversations between works that you were trying to stage mm -hmm. um, and how that started to kind of really bring together for you your kind of curatorial mm -hmm. practice and way of staging juxtapositions to create conversations. Right. Well, I think it's interesting because the word that's used to talk about the exhibition the most is controversial, um, which used to bother me until it became a PSAT question. You know, one of those questions where you have to fill in words. Yeah, I'm a PSAT question. Amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it's controversial is the answer, right? Um, oh my God. The sense about me and my exhibitions, <laughs> right? Um, so that's okay. Um, so here's here's a bit of the curatorial thinking. You know, what became very clear. Um, you know, again, a piece of gratitude and credit, Greg Tate. Greg mm. Tate really is the reason black male was called black male, because black male didn't have a title, and it needed a title, and there were deadlines, you know, deadlines for the book and deadlines for, you know, printing, and it was at the time when the Voices offices, your world's offices were on Cooper Square, but what was the name of the liquor store there? Cooper Square, wine, whatever that was called, had a loading dock, and Greg used to be there a lot, just kind of, you know, in his office hours. And I went to see him. <laughs> That's amazing. We were all in the liquor shop yeah. a lot. No, I went to see him outside there on Astor Those Place. Those were the days. Oh yeah. my God. I went to see him on Astor Place. Well, see, here's why I had to go see him. This is pre-email. Like, all right. this had to get done. We didn't have cell phones. You had to meet people. We had to meet. Like, oh, that's yeah. that. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. We didn't, we, to do anything, we had to go see each other. And I went to see Greg, and I was thinking about what the title should be, and had begun to think about blackmail as a title. And I said it to Greg, and then he repeated it back to me in his Greg Tate voice, those of you who know Greg, and it seemed perfect. Then it was like, mm. this is the title of this exhibition. But one of the things that was very clear early on when I would say to people, you know, in my my elevator pitch, what are you making a show about? I would say a show about black masculinity in contemporary American art, and people assume that exhibition would only be the work of black male artists. Mm -hmm. So either people wanted it to be that, or they assumed it was that. So some of the curatorial thinking right away was, could I make an exhibition 
about race and about identity, but through a range of artists. So that the fact that Leon Golub stood in that group of sort of senior artists in the exhibition alongside Robert Colescott was critically important to me. The fact that Jeff Koons was in the exhibition alongside mm -hmm. Alorna Simpson, Glenn Ligon, Karen Weems, critically important to me. The fact that the exhibition looked at artists like Mel Chin or Byron Kim, you know, just through the lens of how their work was involved in this conversation was critically important. So some of the way in which the show was installed, the way we thought about the exhibition on the floor with the help of J.R. Sanders, who designed it, um, for us was to create um, a narrative that did not start chronologically or did not privilege one version of this story, but created this kind of cross conversation mm -hmm. between the artists in their range of ages, generation, gender, and, and race. And so that's sort of how really as we got to, as I came to an installation, mm -hmm. it really began to make sense that that's how it would play out. The exhibition though, very much, you know, certain choices presented themselves in very obvious ways. So Fred Wilson's guarded view was yes. very obviously mm -hmm. from the moment it came mm -hmm. to be as a work of art, existed as the beginning yes. and the end, right, yes. of the exhibition. That was sort of, I guess, my meta moment of sort of making sure that the context of the museum was a mm -hmm. part of the conversation mm -hmm. about black masculinity. Um, I think it's important to, this is just a footnote, um, but what was emotionally and aesthetically very important to me that I saw Thelma do intuitively, and I watched it um, and was very moved by this. Here's the thing, Huey, um, a lot of black men are not claimed in this country. Mm -hmm. We don't have fathers. Mm -hmm. this, is the, this is the assumption, right? that we don't have fathers to learn from, mm. and that we come up like mushrooms somehow, um, and that there is no tradition for your masculinity, there's no tradition for your blackness, mm. there's no tradition for your intellection, there's no tradition for your ability to look mm. and talk about and articulate where you come from. Mm. So what Thelma did was choreograph mm. the history so that people could see that there were connections and that there were histories between not only black artists, but perforce black men. And that's, for me, um, the profundity of the exhibition. I remember watching her. She did it very quickly. She installed very, very quickly. And she, I remember she was placing some things on the floor and she said, what do you think? And it took me, you know, four seconds to get an answer out. She's like, all right. And then she just moved in a while. I had to go fast. <laughs> so, um, but what, what she had that a lot of people didn't have was an incredible father herself. Mm. So she had been fathered mm. beautifully. And what she gave these artists basically the younger artist, was a tradition and a father. Yes. And so when you walked into that show as a black man, boy, child, you understood that you had a tradition. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the first times, the first instances rather, in a cultural context where you actually saw that you belonged to some place. Mm. And that's really important to, to say. Yes. Yeah. Too. Now, now the, the, the amusing part is um, how, how Thelma made me work, or worked it for me. <laughs> um, she did something also that was quite extraordinary in terms of the book, and the rigor of the book really is Thelma giving me permission. Mm. Um, Art historians and academics are not used to being edited. And I edited people. The uproar. In this really? Thing, Do tell. In this institution, <laughs> it was, you know, bring it dinner, wine. <laughs> but um, she was able, she gave me the permission as a thinker to say, this can be better. Mm. Um, and she let me do that. Um, and that's another thing that's important to acknowledge that because she was making a visual tradition that then 
was an emotional and intellectual tradition, she made a language tradition in the book. She couldn't yes. do that. She couldn't do that rigorously without it having an artifact or a memory. It, there had to be a book that was a memory of this. Mm. Of this, real, It was really, to me, a happening more than anything else. Yeah. It was going back to the 60s where so, you walked into a hall and the profundity of the experience was beyond, was beyond stasis. Mm. You know, there was an intellectual and emotional energy that was so much related to happenings that the book had to be the memory that was solid and the thing that people referred to. So that was another way in which she protected me and took care of me and the writers by allowing me to be rigorous with them. I think that's so, I mean, I mean, it's beautiful and so, I think, informative because even with these images that we're seeing that give us a sense of the exhibition, you still don't have a sense of what it was like to walk through it, that kind of like affective texture, the kinds of atmospheres that it was producing. Um, and one of the things that's been really striking for me in looking back over some of the criticism is how there's this persistent, um, anxiety on the part of black male critics from a range of ideological positions, right? From those who are like the authentic, authenticity, positive imagery police to people who seem to be most radical going into that show and somehow expecting themselves to be there. Right, expecting themselves to appear. And I think, Hilton, what you're saying is actually such an interesting kind of productive counterpoint to that because it's not about the show offering a kind of mirror or uh, image of oneself, but providing a kind of context and this tradition to understand not only how one as a black male might be kind of visually produced, but the many ways that one can work with and through that kind of visual production. Which yeah. everybody, it's, um, I, I had the pleasure of teaching at Smith, um, where Thelma's alma mater, and it's a great school, and I would always tell the students at the beginning of each semester in each class, I would say, please cherish this place. Mm. You're in the majority. Being in the majority makes you feel better. Mm. No one will care when you go out into the world, that, but you will know that you were in the majority of something, and I can spot a Smith woman a mile away. They walk into that room, <laughs> and they, that's their room. Um, what blackmail did was it put it in the majority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Regardless of color mm -hmm. of the artist, the subject was the majority. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, what was important is that I imagined, you know, you know, it's well known. Um, I had the wonderful occasion a few weeks ago when Hilton was um, sitting in for Kurt Anderson on his show, Studio 360. He invited me to come on, and, um, and I said yes, simply because he told me he also was interviewing Toni Morrison. And just so that, the, the idea of that, and Candy Alexander, was Ooh, too good. The right. Supremes. Yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah. So I agreed based on that. And what was so um, enormously, um, uh, emotional about it was that, you know, you're in this little radio booth, but, you know, I forgot that I wasn't talking to Hilton on the telephone as I am often talking to Hilton on the telephone about many things. But one of the things that Hilton got me to talk about was my childhood, as he often does. Mm. Yeah, I'm amused as he can be by, you know, my childhood obsessions of like, you know, Helen Willis and Mary Tyler yeah, Moore. Your, your pink phone. And my pink telephone. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. You know, and all those things that you get me to say over and over yeah. again. But what was really, really, really important to me, you know, thinking that day when we were talking was also that, you know, I decided I wanted to be a curator when I was 15 years old. Mm. It was, you know, my junior year in high school. And not only as my high school friends remind me, I didn't just say I want to be a curator, I want to be a curator at the Whitney Museum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay? Mm. Very specific. And it was because I spent, you know, those high school years, those sort of, you know, 80s years going to the Whitney, mm. seeing those exhibitions, seeing those biennials, and it formed my sense of what I want to be as a curator. So when thinking about making the exhibition, I also, I was not just thinking about the art and the artist, that was core, but I really was invested in this idea of audience. I was mm -hmm. invested in an audience that was me, the me that I was mm -hmm. thinking about mm -hmm. museums as the space that for me were so filled with wonder and inspiration that I then 
uh, some years later had the opportunity to work in. So that was what it was. I also was probably not as aware as I am now. And I think back to that moment. You know, when I think of the opening of blackmail, literally that night. Do you remember that mm -hmm, night? Mm -hmm. And I can't think of a few other moments where there was this level in the way where I felt mm -hmm. like a shift in the culture. I mean, mm -hmm. that we were not just all there yeah. at the Whitney, but we f it felt almost like it it began to position what this future might be, what mm -hmm. it might look like, what it might feel like. Mm -hmm. When I think about the party mm -hmm. after blackmail, which is something that, that I'm totally comfortable talking because it still remains the best party I ever went to in my life. Mm -hmm. okay. and what people don't, That's how. No, but what people don't remember, 1994, you know, I, again, I was a very young person when this exhibition came out, so was still wholly also invested in popular culture. And yes. again, I have to thank another thank you, Gary Simmons mm -hmm. was in blackmail for that, right? For, for creating for me this kind of deep engagement in the popular culture of the moment and what people probably don't remember about 1994 is that was the year in the in the weeks around Black Mail's opening Biggie Smalls Ready to Die came out Nas Illmatic right, right. Mm -hmm. TLC Crazy Sexy Cool and Mary J Blige My Life right. <laughs> right. no 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 and the Black Mail party which happened after the opening was DJed by Funk Master Flex yeah. what right yeah. and very much invested um, as really the soundtrack of that moment was so much, right, was, of well, the it, music of that moment yes. that, that the show also had this sort of life but, within that conversation. But this mm. goes back to the happening mm -hmm. um, um, reality and, and metaphor that I was saying before, Huey, was that it really was something where you are in a room and you can feel levitation happening. Mm. Um, I want to say that, and also I want to switch gears slightly and talk about black femaleness. Mm, mm -hmm. um, and one day, it was very long hours, um, and one day I was going to meet a, a great friend of mine, and I left the Whitney, and, and I've told some of Thelma's colleagues this story, so I'm going to embarrass her again. But um, I was walking from the Whitney to 80. Second Street or 86th Street up Madison Avenue, and I found myself crying, weeping. And when I got to my friend, he said, "What's wrong with you?" And I said, "In all my life, I've never seen a black woman take space like this and mm. not worry about it. Mm. I had never seen a black woman take the arena and walk around the arena." and make it her own. And that's another part of this very emotional, for me, um, occurrence in mm. the world. It, it, David Ross gave her this space, and she took it. Yes. I had never seen that in my life. Mm. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I mean, I think that, I mean, I think, oh, go ahead. Here, here's what it was, though. You know, the Whitney had this really important history. Mm -hmm. The Whitney had a history with African American artists. The Whitney, through its early days in the studio club, but all the way to the 60s, the Whitney, like all the institutions in this country in the late 60s, was an institution that had to reckon with mm -hmm. what the larger cultural conversations were. I spent hours um, in the Whitney Library in those years reading in the archive the volumes of correspondence that went on as the Whitney curators of that era, the late 60s into the 70s, sort of reckoned with the changes mm -hmm. in the world that required a thinking um, and, and, and looked also at their answers to those questions in the many mm -hmm. exhibitions that happened at the Whitney um, in the late 60s and the early 70s. You know, Jacob Lawrence's exhibition, I used to look at the press photos from that opening. Wow. Again, a moment when that space was so beautifully occupied yes. um, by this vision. So I really felt like what I was doing was actually just sort of giving light to the possibility that right. had already been created been archived, mm. yeah. in the institution, yeah. and then quite possibly that would continue mm -hmm. to be. You know, yeah. it didn't feel, and it still doesn't, it didn't feel singular at all. Right. It felt like it was something, a part of this 
greater history. And you know, I just felt very privileged in that moment that it could so wholly come from my ideas, right? Yes. That, that blackmail could come so yes. wholly from that. You know, some of the reason it is also really well known that I, um, up until Carrie Mae Weems invited me to be part of the amazing series of talks that she did at the Guggenheim on the occasion of her retrospective mm -hmm. last spring, I had not read the reviews to blackmail. Mm -hmm. um, it was very, you know, blackmail open, like the openings were a Tuesday, Wednesday night, open to the public on Thursday, and the Times Review came out on Friday. Um, and I left on Friday. I went to Miami, actually. And again, pre-internet days, you could escape things. <laughs> and I left, and but then came back, um, you know, three days later, fully ready to engage in a public dialogue about the exhibition, but not in a public debate with its critics. Yes. And so, you know, with, it was actually quite easy. I just decided not to engage right, my reactions to the press as the way the public would experience me through the course of the exhibition. And then mm. once I didn't read them in those first three months, it kind of just felt like it didn't need to happen. And it wasn't until Carrie's program that I read aloud on stage um, Michael Kimmelman's review, wow. um, which yeah. 20 years later, I mean, you know, it was, that was easy to do. Yes. But at the time, it felt to me like I also, in this idea of claiming space, I needed to claim my space. Right. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that could not necessarily be so infected by what clearly... Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. There was nothing right. self-conscious about it at all. Right. You were just doing it. Right. And I was observing right. you do it. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. But I have a question for you, Thelma. What, um, I only knew a few of the artists personally. So what was the response to the other artists when artists saw themselves in this context? What Do you remember having conversations with some artists? Well, you know, what I remember is that almost all of the conversations with artists in the exhibition usually began with their sense of um, both surprise but actively wanting to be a co-conspirator with me yes, in yes. what would be mm. what this exhibition could be. Mm. And that's what was so amazing yeah. about it. That, you know, every single artist, every conversation about people's individual contribution to their work also took into account what was the great responsibility we all felt mm. to what the dialogue around this exhibition would be. And that was um, fantastic. I mean, from a curatorial perspective, I can't think of any other project I've made that had that sense of collectivity mm. um, to it. But some of it was also because, you know, I'm going to say this myself, I don't think any of us, again, knew right. the sort of the before and after, right? right? What what that moment was going to be. And so that was um, exciting, but also incredibly um, instructive to me. Mm. It really defined the way in which I understood I would have to be a curator moving moving forward moving forward yeah yeah no i think i mean all that is so rich and i think it really helps expand and in many ways explode the kind of sense that we have of the show in its context. Y'all have provided this multiplicity of different ways of sort of thinking to the communities it's speaking, because there's a sense in which, because of the timing of the show, as OJ was happening when, you know, you got to LA, those became these optics, right, that kind of over-determined the much broader, kind of richer conversation that was, you know, happening in the space of the exhibition. And I think people are you know, have been able to pick up on that and to take up blackmail and use it in, you know, a variety of ways. I think, as Hilton's mentioned, because it's such an interesting, important model of a kind of um, black woman taking space, but also, I think, of a powerful feminist curatorial vision, um, which we see, I think, throughout your work. And as of thinking about that question, Hilton, I mean, I, I think then, you know, of the women. And I wonder if there's a way in which the sort of conversation around the show and working on that started to inform what you were doing in that project, you know? Um, wow, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think by example, I think not so much narratively, but by example, um, Thelma, um, in, by example, more than imply that it was okay to get yours. And you were there when I got the review of the women that was a great review in Thelma's office. There was a fax machine. Yeah. And um, she was at the Whitney downtown. And um, I, my agent said, oh, there's, you should read this. And I said, oh, um, I'll come to the office and pick it up. 
And he said, oh, is there a fax? This is the conversation. <laughs> and Huey was there. He was just starting to intern. And it came through the fax machine. And Thelma just beamed, because she was reading it as it was coming through. And she was beaming because she knew that it was a very complicated thing for me to sort of step up to myself. Yes. Um, it, I think it was by example and that you could do it. Mm. You could make the book. You could make the exhibition. You could make um, the catalog. Um, it, was, it was do it yourself with other people, mm. um, if that makes any sense at all. Um, I just wanted to read this, Huey, this little paragraph from, because yes. we've been talking about Greg. And I loved what he wrote um, in the catalog so much because it, it really does apply to what I've been saying um, about the interlocked, interlockedness of Thelma and black masculinity. Mm. Um, this is Greg Tate, and his essay begins, so your soul sister, the curator, invites you to write an essay on black male genius. And like, and actually I'm gonna go back and say, this is the feelings that we've been describing. Mm. Um, and this is how little known it was. So your soul sister, the curator, invites you to write an essay on black male genius. And like a fool, you take up the invitation, knowing it's a fool's mission, on a par with trying to explain wave particle theory to a medieval alchemist, or more pointedly, like trying to explain swing to the severely unswung. <laughs> funk to the arid, or a mad flavor to the undeaf, dumb, and bland. Writer and performer Gil Scott Heron once identified himself as a bluesologist, a person involved with the, quote, science of how things feel, unquote. G.W. Hegel couldn't imagine nothing like the blues or Scott Heron when he wrote The Phenomenology of the Mind, but he and Scott Heron are brothers of the same mind when it comes to empirical wisdom. In black culture, as the, as the scribe Bunny Whaler once put it, he who feels it knows it. Mm. So in other words, there was no language, there was no economy of means mm. to describe this. And I think, to me, Greg's essay was the hallmark of the catalog because the piece is beautiful articulation about the struggle to say, I don't know how to say this, mm. but I'm saying it. And the happening element of black male to me was, what is this and we're doing it? Yes. So uh, I guess, uh, and trying to find a way towards a conclusion. Thelma, I'm wondering if you could speak about, I mean, you already started to gesture to how central the 1993 Whitney Biennial and then black male were for you personally and curatorially uh, in terms of your thinking about the intersection between artistic practice, curatorial practice, and all these dis different communities. So I just wonder if you could speak about the way in which black male became this kind of crucible and launching pad and how your sort of curatorial vision evolved, shifted in relationship to that moment. Well, I think, um, you know, again, I, I say it over and over because I have to keep saying it to myself. Remember, this is really the first exhibition I made. Mm -hmm. Right? I'd been doing site-specific projects with artists at the Whitney branch at Philip Morris, amazing projects. I had worked under the great leadership of Elizabeth Sussman on the 93 Biennial, but this was the first fully formed exhibition I made, and as a curator. And so, in a way, it actually freed me, right? Mm -hmm. I often said, if Black Mill is the only show I ever made, I would still feel I had made a curatorial contribution, mm -hmm. but I'd never made a show again. And that's just because it did have this life that was so much bigger than the one I imagined for it, but that came very quickly with it. So because it happened that way, it was very freeing and it allowed me, I mean, well, it was freeing because, you know, then I was the controversial curator, right? So, you know, in a way that does give you a lot of freedom. I, um, but then it also created for me the opportunity to sort of look at many things without them having to be predetermined, mm, right? Mm -hmm. I created an incredible amount of freedom for myself mm. with that, and that was amazing. Um, also, though, what is perhaps most important to me about what Black Male created really is embodied 
Huey, in you, because you know, as part of the personal history that's going on up here, what hasn't been said is that Huey, what was said was Huey was an intern at the Whitney Museum in 1995. The reality was that when Huey applied to be an intern, he wrote his little cover letter and spoke about the impact of blackmail, which, you know, both based on the fact that it was clear he was brilliant and ego, I just thought, we'll hire him, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. He, will, he will be my intern, right? It changed his life. And Huey then came and was my intern and, um, and engaged deeply because in those days, um, you know, again, pre cell phone, pre, you know, email, my whole life was conducted on the phone. So in those days when the phone would ring and it was Hilton or Glenn or Lorna, the person who picked up the phone was Huey. And it was very clear to all of us in that moment, the space in which you already were seeing yourself as part of the dialogue that we had been a part of. And what the thing that is I, I think of as the greatest gift of blackmail is that it did create the space that I see all of you, you and many of you who are sitting here tonight occupying now with so much fierce, courageous intellectual energy and that more than anything fills me with a great sense of both pride and gratitude that I had the opportunity to be able in a small way to make that space which has become so much bigger so much bigger because of all of you. And that's what, that's what it's about. Well, now you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, I think this is a, the moment um, that we turn to open up, uh, open it up for questions from the audience. So you talk a lot about how at the time there wasn't any sort of, that there was a dialogue, but there, was, there wasn't a vocabulary to really describe what was happening. And since that vocabulary has emerged over the years, what do you think, in what ways has that impacted the culture now? And how, like, where does that leave you in terms of what you did then and what you're doing now and the conversation in terms of, like, your articulation of where you are now? What, like, just, it's, incred it's incredible. Yeah, you know, I mean, when we say that there was no language, it's really that there was clearly all of the sort of intellectual rigor that went on around these ideas, but this movement into the institution was mm -hmm. what was the sort of critical thing, right? Mm -hmm. And what I understood myself as, as a curator, was essentially an institutional person owning the, inst the history of the institution I was working in, but also seeking to shift it, right? So creating a language was a way to, to, to imagine and then enact a very important shift. In terms of what it means now, well, you know, now I'm the director of an institution, and as anyone will say, you know, I don't really do much curating. Um, but again, I feel like the great privilege I have now is that my ability to create an institutional structure where this might not be the occasion, but the norm, right? That this, the space in which I am creating at the Studio Museum means that all of the different ways we've articulated what blackmail was or how it happened or how it came to be or the kinds of uh, collaborations that it engendered mm -hmm. can be fully a part of just an institutional structure every day. Mm -hmm. And so that's what it means now. I mean, I have this vision that there'll be some point in my life when I'll like retire and I'll have this sort of great mental space where I'll really be able to kind of look back at that along with many other things and be able to sort of analyze them fully. But the truth is, um, you know, in my work now, I feel the same way I did when I was making blackmail. I feel this moment offers a lot of possibility and I have to galvanize it to all ends to create an institution that can continue um, to live in the legacy that I inherited at the Studio Museum and continue to do that moving, moving forward. I think, so. I think the language issue of there being no, basically that's a, um, a metaphor for there was no, there's no ideology. There was no ideology attached to it. So when people walk into a museum space, they have generally some idea of what they're going to get. Alice Neal, 1950 to 1975. You know, when you say blackmail, representations of, what does that mean? 
Well, when you put, you know, <laughs> sort of, you, you imagine right. also that these works and these artists and their histories then are being sort right. of discussed within the large conversation mm -hmm. about contemporary art. That's what also was right. important about it. Yeah, and I think the show was also so important in being this touchstone that contributed to a kind of transformation of what would be possible within art historical discourse. I mean, I think for someone like me, for someone like, you know, my brother W. English, that show opened this space where one could really think seriously about these artists and reframe the terms of art history as it had been constructed. And so I think it's, you know, an exhibition that mattered on the front of art history, but I think it also mattered deeply for other curators who also are adopting a feminist approach and trying to think about sight lines in these juxtapositions. And I think it also, you know, of course, matters deeply for contemporary artists. So just this year, there was um, a performance program called Black Male Revisited, where this group of artists um, were trying to think about, well, what does black male mean now for us? How do we think about that in relationship to and issues of queerness and transgender? How do we put pressure on not only what is black, but what is male? And so I think it's this touchstone, right, that in going back to it allows when it, when for- When it's not ignored or killed, that's yeah, what you mean. Right. Right. Mm. Right. Oh, but Thelma is correct too, Huey, what you're saying, um, brilliantly pointing out that the context really was Elizabeth's show, um, the 93 show, of the, because that really sort of broke down a lot of walls. And that was, again, something that you couldn't mm -hmm. define. Mm -hmm. um, so that really was a great pathway for, for Thelma, it's well, correct. With yeah. Elizabeth and Lisa Phillips and yes. John Hanhart, really many of the conversations that made the conversation about black male possible happened around right. the 93 biennial right. among the four of us. Other questions? I see someone in the middle there. Can you talk about where we were and where we are now since the black male in relationship to Fred Wilson's installation uh, the fact that Fred is a multiple exhibitor and I believe a trustee of the institution notwithstanding. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, as I said in the beginning, 20 years feels like 100 years ago and it feels like yesterday. And the points at which I understand the time that has passed is when I look at the way in which the culture world, these sort of changes and the ability to sort of chart these different paths. I mean, you know, again, when I think about all of the artists who were in Black Mill at that time, and imagine that, you know, we have had the occasion with many of them, most of them, to in 20 years sort of understand their work as existing right at the center of the dialogue of contemporary art. I think, you know, again, it's where I see the history of that moment really sort of profoundly living right now. And it's incredibly um, gratifying to me. And it also, you know, fills me with the sense of the possibility of the work that continues that will keep creating the opportunity for these changes. Other questions? And, and also, so just another part of your curatorial, curatorial practice that I want to acknowledge in that show in particular was that there was a great deal of wit. Um, there were things that were very funny. I know, but no one got those. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, that was you and I. Okay. <laughs> okay. You know, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We can table that. Yeah. 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 Other questions? Yeah. Can't see. There was a young woman before. Yeah. Right, in the middle, stand, stand, stand up. up. You have to so stand up, can, honey. Yeah. Oh, per. Stand up and be counted. That's the lesson of this, uh, this panel. So I suppose this is um, kind of a difficult or controversial question to ask, but when you were planning and curating this exhibition, did you put any thought, in terms of your audience, did you put any thought um, towards the white audience, or did you think of perhaps escaping catering something to that white male gaze that, you know, I guess mo most exhibitions before that were catering to. Do you, do you see so what I'm just saying? to be clear, you're asking mm -hmm. me, did I think about the white audience? Mm -hmm. Completely. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, often people say to me, you know, I could write a book of the questions I've been asked about black male, right? That could probably be a book, right? Yeah. Over the last 20 years. <laughs> and, you know, question number one is always, did you consider doing black female? 
That's the first question I'm always asked. Question number two is often a question that has to do with the idea of, as I said, the construction of the show, who the artists were, right? Did I consider making a show only of black male artists? But in terms of this issue of the audience, I was profoundly aware of who I was speaking to. My wish, of course, was that the exhibition would have the ability to speak to these wide audiences, but essentially, I was an employee of the Whitney Museum making an exhibition as a curator at the Whitney for what I could only predict would be a Whitney audience, you know? Something also forgotten at that time. Also on view at the time of Blackmail was the Franz Klein show. <laughs> so you know how like in the, in, the, um, in the former Whitney building, so you have to start saying that now, the former Whitney building, the elevators often open on all floors, right? So, you know, it would open up and there was, you know, Fred Wilson and then some people would keep going. They'd be like, we're here. <laughs> Buy it. But, um, but I was profoundly interested, profoundly interested in speaking to, you know, and I didn't think of the audience in racial terms, but I thought of the audience in those terms of the language of the day, the typical art audience versus not. Now, of course, I was interested in this wider audience. The Whitney committed to a major um, press campaign, like subway campaign. So we had posters and so on to bring other people to the exhibition. And there are many guards at the Whitney now who were there then, and we still talk about this, mm. how we had a great deal of just pride at all the folks. You could tell from the subway. I could tell. Like, I'd get off at 77th Street, and I knew. I was like, OK, they're coming to see blackmail, mm. because you know, it was the Upper East Side of you know, the 90s. And what's all <laughs> true, you know, I do. That's what, that's what I come to see. But also what's profound, you know, again, it's, it's so hard to imagine some of these things now, but, you know, an anecdote I've told many times, which I won't tell the whole story of, but the point of was that at that time, when that exhibition came out, I was not very known at all. And there are many people who, reading about this exhibition of black men at the Whitney Museum, curated by Thelma Golden, thought Thelma Golden was a middle-aged Jewish woman, and would say so. No, really. Um, at the time, New York had a very active um, African-American talk radio station, WLIB, which my father listened to in his office. My father is an insurance broker and lawyer. And in the office, they would have it on all day, right? It was, you know, their NPR. And there was a call-in show every day. And as the exhibition opened and the conversation about it grew larger and larger, every day someone would call in to this show to complain about the Whitney and this exhibition curated by Thelma golden right the white woman and my father whose name is Artie Golden <laughs> okay Artie Golden got very upset about this so upset that he threatened he kept saying I'm calling in I'm gonna call in I'm gonna and I would say please don't do it more just as my father because I know that's what he would have done he would have called up and said I'm her father and she is Right, and he did not, but it was very interesting to me how even at that time, the politics of not just who the audience was, but who made the show were so interesting and profound. So I was first speaking to the Whitney audience. I really wanted to have this conversation. We had already, as has been said, we had it in 93, but I want to continue this conversation about what were the bounds of contemporary art? What could it be involved in? What could it cover? But I also was equally interested in opening that museum, as it had been open to me as a high school student to a wide audience of people who might see themselves reflected in the ideas that the exhibition was about. It's funny, I told Artie Golden that I was talking about this today and I said, Daddy was 20 years ago. He's 20 years ago. He, he thought it felt like longer, a longer time ago. <laughs> and I was like, you're aging both of us. Hello. Yes. Um, it was 1994 in New York City, so I'm wondering how the AIDS crisis informed the exhibition. Yeah, you know, it was a really um, important part of the exhibition, both because it AIDS informed just the entire art community at that time, right? We were in a moment where um, sort of AIDS, but the activism around it was really a part of this larger conversation about the bounds of contemporary art, but also very particularly at that, poem, at that moment, because, you know, within that time frame of between the 93 biennial black male and black male going to LA, 
was the sort of conversation beginning to be around AIDS and its relationship, not just to the gay community, but the black community. Mm -hmm. And that became, again, another intersection point. You know, one of the hard things about that exhibition was that um, you know, it was time the way it was time. It opened up, but it felt like from the moment it opened, every week there was a sort of public conversation in which these ideas were being discussed. And I was invited into many of them. And I have to say, as a curator, that was a profoundly interesting experience for me, to be in the kind of conversations that put the exhibition and some of the artists and the ideas in their work within these larger public debates. And definitely at that moment, considering um, AIDS and where and how how it was being understood in art, but also in the culture, was a very important part of how I thought the exhibition would and could have a life that was sort of larger than the bounds of the walls of the museum itself. Mm -hmm. Questions? Oh. Um, you, well, you know what? They'll bring you one. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't because um, Kim Drew has the mic. Sorry. Well, no, Kim has the mic. <laughs> Oh, and then, okay. 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 Is that on? I'm gonna get out. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. um, hi, so, thank you guys so much for this incredible panel. Um, my question's for Thelma. At the time, like from my reading about the exhibition, you were named a very controversial curator. Like what for you was the biggest anxiety with dealing with that as a, a way of being understood in the public? And it's too prone. So also like what, um, advice do you have for people now, especially in this moment of social media where everybody wants to be, you know, heard? Like, mm -hmm. what, what were your biggest anxieties and how did you overcome them? Well, my biggest anxieties at the time were um, being misunderstood. So, mm -hmm. you know, what existed in that moment around the controversy was a lot of very direct, extremely direct attack. You know, so again, I've, I've thanked many people many times. The head of security at the Whitney at that time was someone I spent a lot of time with. I got a lot of really troubling mail, like so troubling that I'm sure I didn't see some of it, right? That's how bad um, some of it was getting in that moment. And that was difficult. It was difficult for, on a personal level, not professionally, because I clearly made a choice to be in a public debate, but very personally. It also opened me up to a lot of kinds of public dialogues, which I still have, right? It is not uncommon in any kind of encounter I might be in that somehow, and 20 years later, black male comes up. Right? People say, you're that woman who, and you, I know where that sentence is usually going to go, and that becomes and can be an interesting conversation. But my anxiety was more that I handled it, because I really felt like I truly, you know, we used to talk in those days deeply about the politics of representation. I was representing, and that really required thought on my part all day, every day, every moment um, that I was in that space, um, that I was made on that show. What's my advice now? I'm, you know, I'm not sure because I am, as you well know, confused by the mode of the moment where things are so immediate and the ability to have a sustained conversation, even when that's hard and complicated, you know, happen in this sort of nether world, right, where no one touches or sees each other in it. I mean, as hard as it was to have the kinds of very direct, you know, I mean, you know, in those days, Glenn will remember, you know, in sort of public environments like this, there would inevitably, one person would get up, and I knew, like, before they even started talking, I was going to get it, right? And I was going to really get you know, blame for a whole lot of things. Like the show just opened up so much conversation about that. But I really learned to take that because for me, what that did is it meant that I could always be having conversations about art and artists, right? Being in that space meant I could continually talk about the ways that art was important to me and that art can teach us and allow us a space of dialogue. You know, now I would just say that it's important to be clear about your ideas. And when in these many spaces one can have now to put them out there, be clear that the ideas you're putting out there are important to you now and quite possibly can be important to you later as well. Thomas J. Lotz. <laughs> Thank you so much for tonight. Um, it's like watching your parents on a stage in some <laughs> ways, in some okay. proud ways. Uh, Can I at least be your uncle? Uh, <laughs> <you're before. laughs> Can I say that to it's, say, you know, uh, no. Honey, I love you, know. but you know what? We I was drunk by the time you were born. So. <laughs> 
I know I'm old. Yeah. No, it's not about being old. It's about uh, knowing that you have the privilege to talk about the things that matter to you and you have an audience to talk about those things and oh. that you can have a job and that somebody will pay your bills every other week because this conversation matters. Oh. Mm -hmm. And I guess the question I have for you, um, Thelma and Hill, um, is 20 years later, as you think about not only the place of artists of color in the art world, but also the kind of capacity of art and artists to act in the social world, um, how do you reflect on um, that ability today in our moment? Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Thomas. Um, in many ways, um, I'm sitting here doing this talk because Thomas sort of always pushed me. Again, when Thomas interviewed for Venice's position at the Studio Museum, he told me that his mother took him to see the show when he was in middle school. Again, one of those moments where I just thought, oh my gosh, I'm so old. <laughs> <laughs> but also, it always, you, along with all of your colleagues, both past and present at the Studio Museum curatorially, have always kept me connected to understanding that I have to be invested in this idea of what the work has been in order to be able to provide some space for you all to do the work that I know you will do. And so I, I totally appreciate that, even though it makes me always get into these spaces that I'm not so sure that if it were just up to us, we'd be talking about something else right now, right? Like <laughs> girls, right? Uh, Hilton and I. You know, I know the feeling is that we're sitting around 20 years talking about black men, but we're not, right? right? We, there's so many other things that we've been talking about. But, you know, really, I don't know how to answer that question, Thomas. I don't. I, I can answer All right, it. answer it, Hill. Um, <laughs> the promise, really, of that show is at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Um, what happened um, 20 years ago, the reason Thelma can't remember the, uh, the frisson of the moment, of creating at that moment, is because she's creating now mm. at the Studio Museum the promise that the Whitney gave her. Mm. She was able to make, she was able to fully realize through the promise of young artists that she nurtures now and young curators such as yourself that she nurtures now. So the seed was planted at the Whitney and it's bloomed at the Studio Museum in Harlem. That's a wonderful note to end on. Please thank Thelma Golden and Hilton House so much. Thank you, Hewitt.